Welcome to our second panel. And here we're going to look at the, in more depth, at the National Security Council, uh, having looked at the agencies. You'll notice in the book, which we hope everybody is going to get hold of after the meeting, uh, that there's a, a, quite a set of chapters, really very good chapters, on the NSC. And uh, we're fortunate to have two former national security advisors with us today. And in the bipartisan traditions of the Aspen Strategy Group, uh, one who served under George W. Bush, one who served over Barack Obama. And uh, uh, we were going to have a third, which would have been unbalancing. Condi, I mean, not Condi, uh, Susan was going to join us in, uh, 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 but we were told that she is meeting on a transition uh, event with the Trump people. So that presumably uh, deserves a higher priority. But in any case, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, uh, Steve and Tom uh, with us this morning. And what I propose is that I'll ask a few questions uh, and we'll hear their responses, trying to draw out some differences if we can, and then throw it open to you for uh, questions, same format as we used for the earlier panel. The, uh, there's a very interesting chapter by, by Steve Hadley called Reforming the National Security Council Policy Prescriptions and Recommendations. And since we've been talking about um, the Scowcroft model and it's become the, the gold currency, a gold, the standard of, the, of this uh, argument, uh, Steve starts out with the following very interesting statement that opened his paper. The current National Security Council system simply cannot cope with the vast array of national security, homeless security, foreign defense, and economic policy challenges that the U.S. faces in the world today. Uh, the, print, the current centralized structure of a hierarchy of interagency committees culminating in the Deputies Committee, Principal Committee, and National Security Council, CEF, is basically unchanged from what Henry Kissinger established as National Security Advisor under President Nixon in 1960s. Um, if that system is broken, what do we put in its place? Now, Tom, I think you don't agree that the system is as broken, perhaps, as Steve suggests. But why don't you say a, a little bit about that, and then I'll turn to, uh, to Steve, having quoted him to start us. Great. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here. Great to be with Steve, as, as always, who was one of the great national security advisors. And of course, um, it's terrific to be here with General Scowcroft. Uh, we'll be talking about the, many of the uh, models and uh, processes that he put in place. Um, and of course, every national security advisor since General Scowcroft served has had as his or her goal to uh, be as anywhere near as good as he was as national security advisor and as effective. So it's a real honor to be here today. Uh, on whether or not the system, the system is, is kind of profoundly uh, unable to handle the challenges, I guess, I'd, I guess I think the system has a lot to recommend it. Um, and that uh, the fact is, of course, that over 30 years since essentially the Scowcroft Gate system has been put in place in the United States, the United States has been able to handle uh, and address a, a large range of national security and foreign policy problems and do so successfully. Um, and, uh, and to do, in many cases, handle a range of problems simultaneously. So I think the system actually has a lot of robustness to it. Uh, with a couple of uh, uh, things I wanted to add, caveats. Uh, one is uh, the system actually has to be implemented as it was intended, right? I think that uh, indeed if you look back at, uh, and we can do this in detail if you want, if you look back at some of the major failures that the United States has had in the national security area, foreign policy area, it has been when you've had a failure of process, frankly, uh, when in fact that you haven't had the kind of consideration uh, that is inherent in the system put together by Brent. Um, uh, when, that, when that hasn't taken place is when we've run into, when we've run into problems. I think process failures have historically led to most of the, most of the issues that we have. So uh, if in fact you don't have 
uh, a team in place, as Dove was alluding to, I, I came in at the end of it, uh, his points today, and you have a, uh, a, a set of individuals on the National Security uh, Council team as opposed to a real, a real team. Uh, if you don't have an, in place a, a set of rules of the road and, and, uh, and put in place from the outset, and I, what I would recommend to the next president, as President Obama did and uh, President Bush did before, before him, have the first directive be really clarity in writing as to what the process and structure is going to be of the National Security uh, Council. Um, uh, if you don't have the National Security Advisor following uh, the Scowcroft model of being a coordinator, a senior advisor to the president, uh, but not uh, being a, a principal public face, if you will, of the of foreign policy, of, that, of having that being handled by the cabinet office. If you don't have that, you're going to have problems, right? But I don't think that goes to the, I don't think that goes to the fundamental soundness of the, of the system. The last thing I'd say, Joe, in the kind of opening is that there are, of course, improvements that could be made uh, to, uh, to it that reflect uh, the kinds of challenges that we are, uh, uh, that we see uh, coming on the horizon. And I'll just mention one, then we can get into more, more detail. Um, uh, you know, currently we have um, uh, a national security advisor, and there, I think there are right now four or five deputies uh, in, the current, in the current system. Uh, but you have a principal national security, deputy national security advisor, who is essentially the chief operating officer and crisis manager for the national security system in the U.S. government. Uh, we have what I think has been a successful uh, uh, economics deputy uh, who uh, dual reports to the national economic advisor and to the national security advisor. And I think that system has worked, has worked pretty well. And we have a counterterrorism advisor, and who also handles homeland security uh, issues. I uh, think that um, what we don't have an, is enough focus on cybersecurity and technology. I, I, I'm chairing the President's Commission on Cybersecurity. Uh, our report is due uh, in, uh, in December to the President, um, and it essentially is a transition document for the, next, uh, for, the next, for the next administration. I think that we do not have the focus and um, uh, a kind of the uh, a level uh, and visibility uh, in the U.S. government cyber issues right now, and I would certainly recommend a change. Uh, if I were going to make a structural change to the to the uh, National Security Council, now I'd recommend having an assist, adding a, adding a fourth deputy, and having an assistant to the president for cyber security and technology policy. Why? Uh, I think you have at least three problems with respect to cyber security. One is bandwidth. Uh, I, don't, I think it's it's asking just much too much for the assistant to the president for homeland security, uh, and. Um, uh, counterterrorism uh, to be able to handle cybersecurity uh, as uh, as well. I think that that's a and I, my my own bet is that it, it it takes up a distinct minority of the time allocation and mind share of the um, of the assistant to the president right now. Uh, second is that I think the cybersecurity issues are growing as a threat to national security, uh, growing both in terms of the volume of of uh, threats that we have, but also the sophistication of threats and the and the range of. Um, attack vectors that we have. Uh, I think it's going to become an increasingly uh, difficult, uh, a difficult issue. And third, it's a matter of expertise. Uh, these are highly technical issues, uh, and that again, I don't, I don't, I just don't believe that, that an assistant to the president, who may be a superb counterterrorism advisor, uh, is going to be the kind of uh, person that you need in terms of expertise to handle cybersecurity. Now, the last thing I'll say about this, and we can go to other structural things, is I also, as I said, I would add technology policy and national security to that person as well. Why do I say that? Technology is becoming uh, an increasing part of national security and, and foreign policy. And if you go through uh, each of the agencies, uh, you know, Nick's panel talked about, and you think about the impact that uh, the digital economy has on um, our e international economics, right? If you think about the impact the cybersecurity and digital issues have in the intelligence community, right? Uh, certainly in the defense community right now. Uh, you really do need, a fo I think, a focus and a kind of an expertise uh, to handle in the interagency process making policy about those technologies and how they relate to, to, uh, to national security. And of course, the last thing I'll say about this, I do think we need in this White House uh, a, a locus uh, where the technology community can talk in an informed way about national security policy. Um, as we, as we go forward. So uh, even there are some other structural things that you can do. So I, I, think, that, I think it's been a robust system. Uh, it's robust if it actually is implemented. Um, and I do think that there are some structural things that we could, that we could change, and that would be the principal one I would, I would recommend. Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I want to come back to cyber because both Zoe and Jane raised it also in the first panel. Mm -hmm. But first I want to go to Steve and ask uh, how broken is the system as you start your sure. chapter with it. Sure. 
So one of the things, uh, um, I agree with almost everything Tom said, and I can talk a little bit more about it. One of the things I uh, agree with Tom is the role and importance of Brent Scowcroft in this whole system. It may be that Henry Kissinger gave us the interagency process, mm -hmm. but Brent Scowcroft gave us the example and model for how to be a national security advisor. I did a piece called The Role Importance of the National Security Advisor, and who is on the cover? But Brent Scowcroft is talking to George H.W. Bush, and there's a reason for that, because Brent owned and made the model and made the role, and all of us who followed tried to emulate it. Uh, he can disavow uh, much of, not all of our steps, but they were heirs of, uh, not of, of the model. We tried, all of us tried to follow the model, and I will tell you personally, I would not be on this stage and I would never have been National Security Advisor if I had not had the privilege of working for Brent Scowcroft. So thank you. Uh, I'm usually a, a moderate person. I'm a glass half full person. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not a glass half empty person. But I think my opening paragraph has accomplished its purpose, which is I think the team that comes in needs to step back and take a look at the system and look at the process. It hasn't changed dramatically in 30 or 40 years, and there are not many institutions that are, continue to be optimal and relevant 30 or 40 years in when the pace of change is such as it is today. So I think it's, I would urge the new team to come in and step back and take a look at the model. What are the things that worry me about? worry me about, because I think it has accomplished a lot of things. And this is not a criticism of the last administration. I think there have been some trends over the last three administrations. A tendency to pull things into the White House, um, and of course the more you pull into the White House and that in, interagency process, the less bandwidth there is for any particular problem. It also means that in the prioritization, things tend to get to the top of the queue for that process late in a crisis. And the problem about things coming to the attention of the interagency process and the president late in the process is a lot of your options are in the rear view mirror, particularly the soft power options that take a long time to have an impact. So some issues almost come in, Mr. President, you can either send in the Army or the Marines or you know, you're not gonna affect this very much. That's way late in the process. So I worry about whether it has a bandwidth given the array of crises we have. Brent used to say that in the period of the Cold War we had one big problem, which was the Soviet Union and the Cold War. And at any point in time we had one or two other little problems to manage. And the Cold War we had worked on, it was fairly static, we had a strategy in place and most of the Fights were over the tactics. That's a whole different world than we have now. You know, I, I liken it to cooking on a 12 or 14 burner stove and all the pots are about to, 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 to boil over. I'm not sure the system is able to manage all of that. And if you can't, and if you have to wait to things to become crises before they get the, intellig the attention of that process and the president, all you're gonna end up doing is crisis management because you won't have the time to put in place policies and strategies that could head off crises. That's my worry. What's the solution? I think part of the solution is we get to get a sense of strategy back into the interagency process and into the national security system. I think we've got to have the president and his team talking at the level of strategy. What do I mean by that? Bob Blackwell used to say, in any interagency meeting of more than two people, the first thing that gets lost is any sense of what you're trying to accomplish. And in some sense, that's what strategy is. What is the context of a problem? What should be our objective? And then in simple terms, what is, what is the strategy for achieving that objective? And then delegate to not fire and forget, but delegate under the the review and coordination of the National Security Advisor and the staff to the agencies to develop the implementation of that strategy. And I think that then requires you to have empowered cabinet secretaries. 
I think it, re it requires the, the cabinet secretaries to empower the people that work for them to get more out of our ambassadors and our intelligence officers and our military in the field to give them more responsibility and authority but, uh, for, for implementing and executing, but also holding them to account. And it, it is more of a business model. It is not the lawyer's model. I'm a lawyer, and it was not my instinct. I think that is, though, where we need to go to deal with the array of challenges that we face. Thank you. I, I'm struck by another comment that's in your paper, Steve, and I want to ask Tom to start us out on this, which is that uh, a president gets the national security advisor and system that he wants. In other words, it's not, uh, we can sit here and design the optimal system. It's totally irrelevant unless we adjust it to the personality of the president. I was doing some research on, for the course I teach on presidents and foreign policy. Dwight Eisenhower used to meet for two hours a week with his National Security Council, the complete council, and he went to every one of the first 179 meetings except for six. So that's an extraordinary attention from that leader who'd been a general in World War II and used to large staff and knew exactly what he wanted. Jack Kennedy came into office and abolished all that, abolished the whole structure, felt he was uncomfortable with it. Tom, from what you know, and obviously we, none of us know enough yet about President-elect Trump, uh, but from what you can surmise following this view that a president gets the National Security Council and advisory system that he wants, what would you suggest are the things that that from our discussions last summer mm -hmm. might be relevant to President-elect Trump. Yeah, and of course, we're very, it, it's a, a, certainly difficult at this point because we're very early in the, in the, in the process to, uh, to, uh, to make any kind of firm judgments as to where this, what, what direction he's gonna go in. Um, I, th I thought I was supposed to be at this 11 o'clock meeting today with, with Susan, but I guess I'm not invited to that meeting now. So <laughs> 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 yeah. so, uh, I think a couple of things. Um, one is that there are, there are really um, clear lessons to be learned, I think, through experience over the last 30 years. Uh, and the one uh, that, I, that I'd start with is this concept of team. Uh, that in fact, uh, you should, in selecting a national security team, think about it as a team, and purposefully so, from the beginning. Uh, and uh, to think about examples where it is really, um, it's, it's, it's not hard to upset the apple cart and to, um, uh, may have a, a system become dysfunctional really through the appointment of even a single individual on that team who doesn't really uh, participate in a, in a bona fide way in the process. And so that's the first, I think, the first piece of advice that you can draw from uh, looking at the National Security Councils and operations really over the last 40 years um, that, uh, that kind of purposely think about t putting yourself as the president uh, at the head of the table and imagining uh, the uh, group around the table and how they're going to interact, uh, I think is a really critical part of this. Now, uh, some presidents uh, believe that they can handle that kind of uh, friction, if you will, right? Or can handle a set of uh, large personalities who might not get along with each other. Uh, they can't. Uh, you know, a president really, if the president can't be a full-time manager of his or her national security uh, a team, you have to put in place a team that kind of at the get-go uh, is going to want to act as a, is going to want to act as a team, the first point. Uh, the second is I think it really is important to put in place uh, really express rules of the road um, and to do it uh, during the course of the transition uh, and have it, um, as I said, expressed and in writing uh, during the uh, right from the outset of the, uh, right, the administration. What do I mean by that? Uh, principles like the national security system, council system, is the exclusive means by which decisions are going to be made. Uh, in other words, at the outset agreeing that there aren't going to be uh, parallel systems or in runs allowed. Uh, and again, I think if you go back and look at decisions, uh, you'll see these process failures being at the root of a lot of poor, a lot of poor decisions. Uh, second, uh, that the, uh, an integration of the vice president's staff into the National Security Council staff as much as possible, I think, is an important, important rule, uh, kind of rule of the road. Um, expectations with respect to having um, uh, lower level meetings, uh, 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 
uh, deputies meetings and below, having those folks come to meetings able to represent the views of their institutions. So you're not wasting other people's time. So you don't get to the principals, the higher level meetings, right, and come in and have an entirely new conversation and presentation given, because then you've wasted tens of hours uh, below that. I think it's really important to insist uh, the participants in the process come prepared, and they come uh, to have had, a, and, they, and they've had a process in their own institution uh, coming to a view with respect to the question, uh, with respect to the question at hand. You know, on the National Security Council side, uh, an expectation that there would be within, you know, within some number of hours, 24 hours, a summary that would go out uh, to um, uh, to cabinet officers laying out what the what the what the happened in the meeting and giving them another 24 hours or 48 hours to come back and uh, provide edits or object and say that's not what I heard right so many times you, know, you don't want to you have these situations where you get three months down the road uh, and you're building a, pro a policy and someone and someone says well we didn't that wasn't what we decided I never said that you know and and and, and building it in a in a careful way that gives the opportunity for all the participants to. Um, uh, to uh, edit and look at these uh, conclusions, I think, when, right after the meeting, I think is really important. These things sound, um, you know, kind of um, small, if you will, uh, but at the level that where you're operating here, they are not small. Uh, these are decisions that are being made that affect the fundamental uh, future of the, uh, future, of the uh, future of the country, uh, providing you know, uh, the cabinet officers with the right uh, to have their views given directly to the president. Uh, either direct in person or is attached to uh, the memorandum that goes to the president. So I think getting these rules of the road uh, in place, uh, I think at the beginning are really uh, are really important. The last thing I would say on um, again lessons uh, that I would certainly recommend uh, to, to any team coming in uh, is one of the functions uh, that the national security system has undertaken is in the international law area. Uh, and there's, you know, the system that's been put in place really from the Bush administration into the Obama administration where you have a lawyers group uh, that is chaired by the National Security Council a lead council uh, and is available to the principals and the deputies uh, to uh, explore and answer legal questions. Uh, there are, given the challenges that we have, you know, we, we, we certainly went through it in the wars, right, during the, uh, the, the Bush administration phase, the counter the counterterrorism efforts, now cyber. There are just time after time very difficult legal issues of first impression, frankly, uh, that need to have uh, <coughs> a really high level, high quality advice given in a timely way to the principals as you, as you move forward. It also, you know, the, the, uh, the, the lawyers, um, you know, and Steve and I are both lawyers uh, and are kind of comfortable in that, in that, uh, uh, in that realm. But you know, the law, the law is a representation of the values of the country. Uh, and I think it is important uh, as you move along to, to considering and trying to deal with these very difficult problems that you have that resource available to you on a, on a constant basis. I never had a meeting at the, of the National Security Council of an interagency a meeting without having uh, one of the, the, the senior lawyer from the National Security Council there, including the meetings we had for the eight months between August of 2010 and May of 2011 during the bin Laden consideration. So those are some of the things that I would certainly recommend to the new team. Steve, uh, as you uh, think about the characteristics, so far as we know them, of the new presidency, uh, what would be your advice? And in particular, what would you say about the size? Dov, at an earlier session, mentioned re reducing the size. Um, your paper says 100 to 150. What, so what would you say to the new group, and uh, particularly in general, but also with the size question right. included? Well, I think Tom has provided a lot of good advice to the new team. Um, I'm going to just have a footnote to one of the things. I think it's a very centralized model, and I think for the major policy decisions yeah. that a president makes, of if again, if you get it up to the level of, 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 of objectives and strategy, it should be a centralized process. What I'm arguing for is a little bit more decentralization of the implementation and execution to take advantage of a whole of government of hopefully very capable and empowered people. Again, not fire and forget under the review and oversight of the national security system. For example, there's just so much to do, and, and Bob Gates and Connie Rice from time to time, would I'd get a call and they would say, Connie would say, I'm going over to Bob, we're going to talk about X issue. 
She also did that with Hank Paulson. I'm going over to Paulson. We're going to talk about how to have a new approach of sanctions in Iran. And I would say, have at it. And if they could come up something, an agreement between their two agencies that made some sense as the agency's most important, and run it by me, I would run it by the president, great. We didn't need to run that through the interagency process. You can get some more done. Second, I think, I don't know, uh, uh, President-elect Trump never met him. I've read one of his books, uh, and he, it's very interesting. He's a business guy, and he basically says, they ask him in this, in this book, he says his approach is on a given problem, he can't know everything, he gets the smartest people he can, in a relax them in a room, they come out with recommendations, he makes some judgments, and he makes some decisions. That is a kind of a business approach, and I think it would be, he would find congenial the kind of model that I am talking about. Uh, and I hope that was the case. And I think he would also find uh, the, the Scowcroft model for being national security advisor as the right model, because he's not the kind of person that wants to run that. He's going to want to have somebody in whom he has confidence, who will get the most out of the team. That's really what Brent did. Brent got the most out of that team of principles that he was working with on behalf of the president. Um, and that, I think, is a model that, um, that President-elect Trump would, would be very congenial with. I would make th the first point in my essay in this book is national security is a team sport. And I would very strongly underscore what Tom said. I remember a meeting with Brent 30 years ago in an earlier administration where there was all kinds of fights between their cabinet secretaries and someone said, if you were President Brent, what would you do? Brent said, I'd fire one of them, bring somebody else in, fire another one, bring somebody else in, until I got a group of people who could work together, and then I'd have my team. That's, that's the right approach. On the staff, to drive the staff by an abstract number makes no sense. The staff ought to be sized by the mission. So what is the mission of the NSC staff? I think it has a more narrow mission. I think its mission is first to support the president in what the president does under our constitutional system. <clears throat> Help him set up his phone calls, plan his trips, write his speeches, give him memos in advance of world leaders he's going to meet, staffing the president. That's the first thing they do. Second of all, they ought to be the custodians for the president's initiatives in shepherding them through the government. Because if the NSC staff doesn't believe in the president's initiatives, I can tell you nobody else is going to believe in them. Thirdly, the NSC staff should be coordinating the process on big issues that require a lot of, uh, of input and participation from agencies in order to bring the issue to the president. The job of the NSC staff is to run that process in an honest broker fashion to bring issues to the president with all the right options and a clear understanding of the positions of the agencies. And fourth, to then, once a decision is made, to oversee the implementation and execution of that. That's it. And I used to tell the staff, if you're doing something that doesn't fit in those four boxes, stop. You're usurping, usurping the agencies. Now, if you take that approach, What's the problem in government? The problem is stovepiping. And what's the need? It's to integrate across the stovepipes to get a common effort towards a shared objective. Well, if you have a large staff with you know, stovepipes within the staff, you're not solving the problem of the government, which is stovepipes. So I would say you want a fairly small staff. It ought to be sized to the mission but it would be small enough and organized so you can work in teams. And I also think it's better to have more information and fewer heads because you're more liable to see the connections and the priorities and the patterns. So if you have that model, and the president is going to decide what model he wants, but if you take that model, my guess was we're talking about 100 and 150. We're not talking about 300 to 400. But again, and I don't think Tom would disagree with this. It ought to be mission driven. Come up with a mission and then figure out the minimum number of people you need to achieve that mission. Yeah, I think I, I kind of comment on that just for yeah. just a second. I do a couple of things. Number one, uh, I do think it is the responsibility of the president's staff to 
uh, work with the president and the principal to develop the priorities for the administration. They need to be done expressly at the outset uh, and, to, and, to, and to drive it. And, and it, if, it, if it isn't driven from the center, right, you'll have drift. Uh, institutions have other kinds of interests, right? You know, they're very complicated. Uh, and if, you, if you're going to have a set of clear priorities for administration, it is in the first instance going to be driven from the center, I think. I agree with Steve that the, the, and another function of the National Security Council staff is to look at implementation. You know, policy people um, think that, uh, my experience has been, they think that basically you got like 90% of it done when you've got the good idea, right? So we'll meet for, we'll meet for a month, we'll wrestle with it, we'll study it, uh, and then we will come up with an approach, and we're a genius, and we've got, the, we've, got, we've got the right idea, the right policy, right? And of course, that's about 30% of it, uh, because maybe less, uh, because obviously the, the, uh, the key is in implementation and accountability, uh, and that does, I think, have to be uh, driven from the center, at least with respect, to, with respect to accountability. Implementation, the job of the agencies. I do think that we, I would recommend trying to look for more bandwidth, uh, and that can be done by I think, um, Joe, something we talked about this summer, which is, which, which is having agencies take the lead on some of these interagency processes where the center of the problem is at that agency. Uh, and I do think if you have a, if a president has a, has a, a good team uh, and a set of principles uh, uh, that he or she trusts, um, that you can do that. And frankly, I should have looked for more opportunities to do that, frankly, as national, as national security advisor. I try to drive some of the, have agencies drive some of the the, uh, the processes, and, and that, because that expands, that expands bandwidth, I right. think. Um, right. I'll, with respect to this numbers issue, um, I agree with Steve, I, I don't think that can be, um, you really can't drive a, uh, a mission-driven organization with respect to some arbitrary set of numbers. It's about management and mission, and it's about the president, the National Security Advisor, being very clear with the people on the National Security Council staff what their job is, as Steve was describing, and what their attitude should be towards their interagency colleagues, and the conduct that's expected by the president with respect to kind of interacting with the rest of the, with the rest of the, with the rest of the government. You know, the numbers right now are, are it's also it's also misleading. It's about, you know 350 people, but 100 of them are Situation Room people uh, who provide basically the nerve center uh, for the national security system. There are number 20 that are another, another 20 who are in presidential records. It's not that large of a number, frankly, when you look when you look at the professional staff, the total budget of the NSC, let me look at my notes here, of the NSC 2017 budget was $13 million. <laughs> that is a quarter of the cost of an Apache helicopter. Uh, you know, so, you know, I don't, and, and you, could, you could go through carefully and you might take, might, might argue about one or two people, but the, but the fact is, I don't think the National Security Council staff, when you look at the changes that have been made, right, we have added Homeland Security. We have a b much bigger counterterrorism uh, set of challenges. Cybersecurity, economics, energy, right, you know, uh, now you can climate, you can argue whether or not they, you know, they should be policy priorities, but that's really where the growth, I think, has come from. And, you know, I guess my, my bottom line here is I don't, I don't really, I, I think it would be a mistake to try to drive this uh, with an arbitrary number. As Steve said, this is about mission, it's about management, and, you know, in a government of, of several million people, there should be a few people who work for the president exclusively, I think. So that's my, uh, that's my view on it. I'm, I, I'm, uh, uh, count me as um, count me as really objecting to this to, the, to setting some arbitrary number with respect to the people who are working on the National Security Council. I don't think the numbers bear out that there's a huge problem, frankly. Uh, and I think with appropriate management and appropriate missions and the appropriate kind of instruction from the President, National Security Advisor, that it should work. It should work fine. I'm a <clears throat> about to throw it open to the audience, but Tom, I promised you I returned to cyber. I want to return in the context of something that Jane Lute said on the first panel. He said, when we think of defense and the Defense Department, it's very top-down. But Homeland Security is very bottom-up. Mm -hmm. Most of the problem is outside of the formal structure government. You know, 95% of the Internet is privately owned. Uh, if you look at the problem of the Internet of Things, the issue of liability for of the processors that are going to be so vulnerable in the Internet of Things, this is in the private sector. Yeah. And so does it make sense to have a Homeland Security Advisor under the National Security Advisor, or do you really want to have the two quite separate? Well, I, I think, well, a couple of things. First of all, I think it's both top-down and bottom-up with respect to, uh, with respect mm -hmm. to cyber security. Um, uh, but I do, I think that, uh, um, 
I think it should be integrated into the National Security Council. Uh, staff, you, you, we, we, we have seen that um, uh, a range of these issues involve national, they're national security issues, right? And the same players uh, are involved uh, in, uh, in dealing with cybersecurity, cybersecurity challenges. Uh, that the government that the government faces. I said top down and bottom up for, for, for a reason. Though. Obviously, that you know most of the critical infrastructure in the country is owned by the private sector, um, but the private sector, the federal government, is also quite an important uh, 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 system uh, that needs to be protected. And, and uh, frankly, the uh, standard by which it be protected needs to be radically increased in my uh, in my view. Uh, and the government does have an important role in setting examples and standards. Frankly, uh, the standard setting. Uh, function uh, in cybersecurity, as Jane knows well, she, she oversaw one of the most important standard setting cyber hygiene processes we've had in the last four or five years. Uh, the standard setting function is absolutely essential in my, my view. Now, it can't be static, it has to change, there are life cycles to these things, um, but um, there, uh, you know, and the Internet of Things is an example of that. Right now, for example, uh, we have, and we saw it just a couple of weeks ago, you know, this is a um, uh, we're going to have uh, millions and maybe billions of connected devices uh, uh, coming onto the coming onto the scene. Um, there are uh, they can we saw in the in the example in the last couple of weeks they can be harnessed by a malign actor to target a specific target uh, and being able to basically hijack hundreds of thousands of these devices and essentially weaponize a mass uh, a complex of Internet of Things devices. Um, you know, we don't have any standards at this point, frankly, set with respect to, to the uh, uh, security by design from the outset of these devices. The government has an important, and private sector uh, organizations like uh, the you know, comparable things we had in other, other uh, contexts like underwriters labs and things like that. There are important kind of top-down standard setting <coughs> uh, functions that need, to be, that need to be put in place here. The last thing I'll, I'll say about this with respect to kind of top-down and, and the locus of responsibility is that we have a very serious cybersecurity problem emanating from nation states. That's the responsibility of the federal government, right, to defend the country. Uh, that's, a, that's a distinct problem, but I think an increasing problem, and we certainly saw that problem during the course of this election season. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I, I, I don't disagree. I, I want to offer, though, a little different model or, or, or maybe frame the conversation. You know, there's one model that says you got to be integrated, so international economics, traditional national security, homeland security, and cyber all need to go to the, up to the president through the national security advisor. I can't imagine doing that job if that's the configuration, because there's so much stuff in all of those. You know, national security advisor, you got to be flying up with the president on strategy, but you also got to be down into the details to know enough, uh, so when the president said, is this going to work, you're going to be able to say, I've vetted it and I know it's going to work. That's a challenging job and those are four big areas. So another model that you could think about is, and in the Bush administration, the Homeland Security Advisor didn't work for the National Security Advisor. Homeland Security Advisor reported directly to the president. I had to keep reminding the president of that because he liked to have everything's coming up in one phone, a cone. But I couldn't have done both jobs. So you had the Homeland Security Advisor, separate from the National Security Advisor. The person in charge of international economics was also separate, reported directly to the president. How do we, did we integrate? We had a deputy national security level person who dual reported to the National Security Advisor and the Homeland Security Advisor, who dual reported to the National Security Advisor and the head of the International, the international Economic Council. And secondly, we would have the two councils meet together. And we would co-chair meetings. And Fran Townsend used to do that on the Homeland Security issues because that's the way she could make sure that Don Rumsfeld would come to the meeting if it was a joint NSC Homeland Security meeting. <laughs> so, you know, there is a more distributed model that requires people to, to work together collegially, to have some dual reporting uh, and, uh, individuals, um, and, and to meet periodically together, and sometimes convene the interagency together. And I, I would look at those models, because you know this, the, the number of issues is enormous. On cyber, I don't know what the answer is, and I'm hoping that the commission that Tom uh, leads is going to come up with the answer. But you know, this is a whole new area. I mean, this is, as the military says, this is a whole new domain. Air, ground, space, you know, uh, and, 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 and the oceans. Uh, I don't know how to organize it. It's excruciatingly difficult because of the interrelations between the public sector and the private sector. 
And I think one of the things the new administration needs to do, building on the work that Tom is doing, is put some people off in a location and really have them think through how the U.S. government with the private sector is going to organize all of this in all its dimensions and then start parceling it out and institutionalizing it. Once you've done that, what the right role is and how to organize in the White House, I don't know. Yeah, but, but I think we've got to think through the whole problem. I agree with that, which is why you know, I said that basically I think it's not just cybersecurity, but it's also technology <coughs> policy more generally. It's having a, a place in the White House where the technology community uh, can uh, help and have a conversation. We, post Snowden, I think very badly need uh, to continue to build trust between the uh, American companies and the intelligence <coughs> community and the law enforcement community in the United States, which we had for many decades, but was really quite damaged, obviously, by the Snowden, by the Snowden revelations. And there needs to be a place where this happens in a purposeful way. It can't be kind of like a sideline. The technology now is at the center of economics yeah. and national security. Um, and uh, it needs to, as I said, it needs to be a place where, 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 the, where someone is responsible for gathering interagency process to think about how these technologies work into, work into right. policy, but also to have a place where, the, where, the, where you can have this conversation, Steve, that you're talking about. We've had some of it. You know, Ash Carter obviously has set up a, uh, a fun, a, a, an office in Silicon Valley, and he's been spent, as Secretary of Defense, has spent a lot of time on this, right? The State Department, I think, is attempting to do some of the same kinds of things. But it would need to be driven again from the center in a purposeful way to find out what the right, and one of the projects would be to try to work through what the right relationships are with the private sector and to work through on some of the governmental structure things. We don't have it right now. It's right. very ad hoc right now, uh, and I, 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 we, we just, we have to do, we just have to do much better. Yeah. Well, let's, um, <laughs> let's throw it open to the audience. Jane, I saw your hand first. It's coming behind you, Jane. Great discussion. I'm Jane Harmon, uh, a, an analog thinker, and uh, this is what I want to ask about. And that's our cap the capacity of our leaders, and, and this last answer, Tom, of yours sort of segues into my question, to think about digital problems. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you were describing, um, you know, the, the setting the table with a, a stove that had 14 burners all burning at the same time. I would argue that's an old structure. I think we're into convection ovens and things <laughs> that operate by chips and uh, buttons that most of us can't understand. And so as you talk about the influence of technology, which is pervasive, and the problem of cyber, I mean, Joe, Joe is a very young person. He really gets the problem of cyber, which is pervasive. How, how do we train leaders yeah in this system. Um, members of Congress, uh, President-elect Tr uh, Trump, he can tweet, but I wonder if he understands some of this material. The new National Security Advisor, whoever that is, et cetera, to n comfortably work with the material. It can't be an afterthought. And any, uh, it seems to me, any program that, that is developed has to integrate uh, a really sophisticated understanding of this. Uh, and, and so I guess that's my question. Well, you know, no. presidents deal with hard topics all the time. And, uh, you know, the way we do it is you get people who do know the technology and who do know the details and who have a gift for being able to help explain it to people who don't. Because remember, the president doesn't have to get into the each. It's the president has to make, you know, he's got to get the big things right, got to set the direction. And the whole purpose of the NSC staff, in some sense, and his uh, cabinet appointments, are to be that intermediaries between the experts and the people who know and the president who needs to decide. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tough, and everybody's got to be learning in the process, but, you know, presidents deal with hard issues all the time. And, you know, I, I'm, you know if, you, if you have the right structure, um, we can do this. We can do this. I think a couple of things, Jane. You know, one is I do think it's important to, uh, to um, find ways to more actively recruit expertise into the government, um, which is why I would argue for having <coughs> someone in the White House whose job it is to think about this. Part of this is workforce, though, too, right, which is to have ways in which the United States government can, in a flexible way, uh, 
be able to tap into private sector expertise and to have folks be able to come in both at the beginning but also their mid-career and have a, more of a flow, I think, to bring in uh, expertise in these areas into the, uh, into the government. Um, uh, and to have, I said, I said expertise really at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at, at the center of it. I think if there's, um, if I had to look back on my own tenure, it was, if I, I clearly should have thought harder about trying to bring more technolo technologically so sophisticated people into the, into the National Security Council. Second, I think, is to have these um, um, uh, intersections with the private sector more well established and, and exercised, if you will. Um, where we're getting a lot more ex um, benefit of private sector, <coughs> uh, private sector expertise. And the third is in government functions, right, is to integrate, uh, is to integrate this better. Uh, so for example, it's a little one, but what we can think about it is that, no, it's not very little, but think about it. Uh, in procurement, for example, uh, in the United States government, you know, if you talk to the procurement folks and, and you ask them, um, you know, procurement can do a lot of things. It can drive standards. The United States government is the biggest purchaser of IT in the world, right? It can drive standards, right? Uh, into the uh, and, and, into into the broader uh, uh, into the private sector, uh, but it can also you know uh, uh, you can bring better systems into the government. Um, most procurement officers are not trained in cyber uh, in, in, in cyber uh, security kinds of fundamentals, right? That's the kind of integration I think we can do we can do better. But it has to be done consciously. I think at least in the first instance, it has to be done from the center. You know, in the scale of this problem, at this point, you know, I'm seeing Jan here. You know who. Uh, was deeply involved, obviously, in the inter intersection of science and national security for a, a long time. Uh, it's not just in one area right now in arms control. It's now throughout the entire system. So the, the challenge has become uh, just multiplied. I saw a question near the back. Yeah. Uh, yes, this woman right there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yun Jung Lim. I'm teaching Korean politics at John Hopkins University. Um, from my own background, I cannot but uh, ask this uh, question, uh, which is actually related to the cybersecurity issues too. So how would you recommend, I mean, the, for the new administration regarding the North Korea? Not only about the nuclear, not only about the missile, absolutely a cybersecurity issue is also, I think, related to the North Korea's that one. So how would you recommend? Well, we're not going to solve the substantive issue of North Korea and the answers because we're trying to deal with process, but <coughs> how should the government of the NSC approach an issue like this, North Korea? Tom? Okay. Um, I think a couple of things. Um, one is, as Steve said earlier, uh, is to be very clear on what our goals are as a country with respect to, uh, with respect to North Korea and then to think about um, um, all the various attributes of national power we have to achieve that goal. Uh, and I do think that the, that the North Korea situation is, a, is one which is a, obviously um, front and center and will require a complete review of that type uh, to have a, a clear idea of what our goals are, to have a clear idea of what the kinds of leverage and uh, uh, elements of national power we have to achieve it, and then figuring out a plan forward to, to, for, uh, for achieving it. I think it's going to be front and center, though, obviously. See? I don't have anything to okay. Bob? I'm Bob Dickey from Boston, and I come from the private sector. First, thank you very much. It's been a fabulous panel, just, just terrific. Um, I've noticed in the private sector throughout my career that companies that plan to think longer range um, tend to do better than companies that manage the next quarter's earnings. Steve, my question really is, going to come back to the pot spoiling over, or whatever an, an, an analogy you want, uh, the time element of, of all this. Um, to what extent that is longitudinal sense of time? My, from the private sector, I would, my take would be that the companies that are thinking longer range are less likely to be caught by surprise by the 14, sure we still get surprises uh, from here and there, sometimes they converge, they're simultaneous, but do you get a sense that uh, that uh, uh, under leadership where there's a longer sense of time, I mean, certainly Congress doesn't think thinks in terms of the next election, but uh, to what extent in this field do you find, are there differences among leaders in terms of how far ahead they think, A, and B, does that drive a difference in terms of how effective they are? So, you know, there's a, a whole issue here that you've raised, Bob, about can you get strategy and strategic thinking built into an NSC process where the here and now is such a tyrant, uh, and coupled by you know having to deal with the you know ready for the noon press conference and you know the social media inquiries and all the rest? 
Um, and there have been a number of efforts, and one of the challenges for the new administration will be to try to get a cell of people in the NSC that is dedicated to doing longer-term strategy, protecting them from the day-to-day, -day, but somehow getting them in front of principals who are, you know, tyrannized by the day-to-day -day so that they can step back and do some long-term thinking. Uh, I think it's possible. It takes work. It takes discipline. You've got to have a leader who wants it. It's important, and important involved the president, because I believe that in the press, you know, is always thinking about who's going to be Secretary of State and what do they think. And the only, the real question is always, what does the president think? Because I do believe that in the end of the day, the president is the chief strategist for their administration. So getting this sort of sense of strategy into the president, I do think is important. And, and strategy, you know, is not a destination. You're never going to get this perfect strategy, but what you want is a process of strategic thinking so that people systematically begin the meeting by what's the context, what's our objective, what are we trying to do, and in simple terms, how are we trying to do that? That's why you want the strategy piece. You want to get people in that sort of strategic way of thinking. And if you do that, I think it puts you in a much better position to deal with the crises of the moment. Bob, I, have a, I want to come from a different angle just for 30 seconds, which is um, how do you avoid surprise? Uh, this, is, this is a big problem in government, right? You know, we talk, you know, everybody, it's cliche now, the tremendous time compression on decision makers. Um, you know, you've seen that over the last dec decades that the, that the pressure on a decision maker uh, to uh, now in terms of a you know, 24-hour news cycle and things happening around halfway around the world can have an impact here immediately or seen here immediately. That's all, I think, you know, well known and it puts a lot of pressure. But how do, and I think one of the challenges going forward here is this issue of foresight. And uh, why do we keep on getting surprised? This is a, this is a, re this is a really important issue for us to spend some, uh, I think to spend some really serious time on uh, going forward because that's what takes you off your longer term, uh, your longer term, um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, planning, right, is, to, is when you have a, when you have a either, and it's a surprise in two respects. One, an entirely new issue that arises that you didn't, that you didn't see coming. And second, some, some piece of the, of the plan you're implementing which brings you a surprise you didn't anticipate. Uh, so that is a, that, this is a, um, yeah, yeah. So I think this kind of this foresight issue is an important issue. Steve? And you know, one of the things we did, and, and again, it's, it's just one of various tools, but at one point in the administration, we sat down and we said, what are the 10 or 12 things that could happen that would matter that would surprise us? And we did them. And then the question was, can we get someone to think about a sort of first cut at what a strategy, strategic response might be? And we had the list, and some of them in the intelligence community did, some agencies did. Some we tasked out, sotto voce, if you will, to think tanks around the country. And think tanks are enormous resource that we need to enlist in the process of being more strategic in our thinking. Let's outsource <laughs> some of it uh, and, and then bring it into the administration, because you just don't have the time in the administration. Yeah. Of that list of 12, Four of them happened in the next 18 months, and we had at least a leg up on thinking about them. Uh, there's a question. Phil? Hi. Uh, Philip Zalko. This is really a follow-on on the previous question. It's about budgeting. About budgeting. About budgeting. Uh, Steve, in your paper, you talked about the need to have a very deliberate national security strategy planning process that really thought big. And so tying that in to what Dove said in the previous panel, how do you then, what are your, what are both of you think about how best to integrate that kind of thinking with the OMB side of the process, mm -hmm. the budget planning process? Because as you know, for the agencies and in most businesses, uh, you manage through your budgets. Big challenge, we tried three things. Um, one, we had a rule that any policy initiative had to have a budgetary appendix that would describe how you're going to pay for it and where the money was going to come from. Now that, as these things do, kind of broke down over time, but we tried it that way. Second of all, uh, the most successful initiative I know that we did was we developed 
uh, early in the second term, sort of what we called accelerating success in Afghanistan. It was a series of, pro of programs that Zal Khalilzad was pushing. Uh, Robin Cleveland in parallel, who was one of the OMB people, ran a parallel budget process in parallel with the strategy and policy development process. So when they were done, we could bring to the president both the policy and the budget to support it. And thirdly, um, we tried to meet, uh, and again, a couple OMB directors were willing to do this, other OMB directors were not, but the best process was we would meet every, Condi and I, when she was National Security Advisor, would meet uh, every other week with the OMB director and the deputy director, and we would talk about where they were in their process, where we were in our process, what things were coming down the pike that they need to think about. But again, this is, it requires real discipline to maintain these longer term looking processes in the face of the day to day. Yeah, I, Philip, I, I, I have a, this is a really important question. I think there's a more basic uh, challenge here. Um, and where, where we did it, it made a big difference, and where we didn't, we, I think we paid the price. And that is this, is, is, is uh, priority setting, uh, express priority setting with the national security uh, team in the White House and the agency, uh, and working through a strategy which, which tells you what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, uh, what the president would like to see uh, the emphasis on and what he or she um, <coughs> doesn't think needs to be emphasis, I think to be an emphasis on, you know, and you know, Michelle's here, we went through a, a process in January 2012 uh, to put together a defense, uh, defense strategy, which was just about that, right? It was basically about uh, an assessment of challenges. It had a lot of this forecasting element to it that we, that we talked about, and I think we can do that a lot, a lot better, and there's a lot, by the way, we have, we haven't, I think we're way short of integrating into the decision-making process in the White House and in the government, both technology, big data, and also forecasting techniques, uh, but we can talk about that in a, in a side thing. But I do think this priority setting um, exercise, like doing it expressly and, and asking the simple question, what are we going to do and what, what aren't we going to do, I think is really critical to this. The second piece of it is to try to work with the, uh, with the budgeters, right, on multi-year perspectives. Um, uh, now, you do that to some extent in the Defense Department, but it's not done at all in the other agencies. And I think if, to the extent that we could get to that approach, um, uh, even informally, right, uh, in, the, in the documents, we would, be, we would be in a lot better shape. Unfortunately, we've uh, run out of time. We haven't run out of questions. But what I can tell you is that if you still have questions, the answers are in this book, <laughs> which is outside. I can't say it's all the answers, but there's some pretty good ones yeah. here. And in the meantime, please join me in thanking Steve and Tom for a very interesting discussion.